Wouldn't it be handy if someone quickly explained each of the nine times the U.S. Supreme Court has taken the Second Amendment up before it and then also ranked them for you in order of importance? My name is Tom Grieve. We're going to be trying to do that right here. I'm an ex-prosecutor, criminal defense attorney, Second Amendment advocate. So guys, let's get into it. <laughs> Nine times. That's how many times the United States Supreme Court has spilled ink involving the Second Amendment to one degree or another. And of course, there are three more times that the United States Supreme Court will be doing it across 2024 with three accepted cases on appeal. But where do we fall in those nine times? What are those cases that are out there? We're talking about the nine cases going back to the 1800s to present day, and we're going to be ranking them on the tier maker list. What is that? So tier maker is going to divide this into S, A, B, C, D. S tier is basically, this is God tier. This is the best stuff. These are hyper important cases that absolutely just change the groundwork of the second amendment a tier super important but not quite there b tier we start to shade down and we get to d tier where it's eh, it's not particularly relevant or maybe it's been overruled or some capacity like that but still worth mentioning so let's get started so we're going to cover these chronologically and the first one comes from 1876 and it's called united states versus crook shank for those of you mowing your lawn that's c-r-u-i-k-s-h-a-n-k and to understand the importance of this super Super quick lesson. Initially, when the Bill of Rights was passed and ratified to include the Second Amendment as, of course, the First through the Tenth Amendments, it only applied as a check on federal government power. In other words, while those in D.C., Congress, and so forth could not infringe on your First Amendment rights, your Second Amendment rights, and all that kind of stuff, it doesn't mean that your local government, state, village, city, town, and so forth, they could do whatever the heck they wanted, basically, because the amendments were not incorporated against them. Now, that all changed with the passage of the 14th Amendment following the United States Civil War in 1868, which incorporated the totality of the Bill of Rights, the amendments, the Constitution, and everything basically on the state and local governments, which means that your state and local government could, at least in theory, now be restricted and have your rights protected from them vis-a-vis -vis the 14th Amendment. Now, that lasted all of about eight years when Cruikshank said, no. First Amendment and Second Amendment, we're deciding that despite the passage of the 14th Amendment, those only protect you from infringement from Congress coming from D.C., not state and local governments. Now, this had the effect of effectively undoing the 14th Amendment. However, it would subsequently be overruled by another case coming up. So that one's starting at D tier because while it was super important at the time, it's no longer good in standing law right now. The next one chronologically was 1886, so 10 years on. That was Presser versus Illinois. And this, among other things, upheld the Cruikshank Court's decision from 10 years prior and allows states to basically suppress private armies. And again, this was effectively overruled, at least on the 14th Amendment part, by a subsequent court ruling. The Presser Court made it clear that the states cannot prohibit people and citizens from keeping and bearing arms. However, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily allowed to organize private armies. That's the super low resolution version of that. If you want more details, let me know in the comment field. I'd be happy to follow up with a more in-depth example and guide to this case. It's kind of interesting, actually. Um, but again, let me know in the comment field below. However, because most of this was wound up being overruled, I'm going to put this in C tier. We do have some of the language out there dealing with militias, dealing with these so-called private armies. And I do have concerns about how that could be used and abused by various administrations and government down the road. But one of the biggest parts of it that upheld Cruikshank and stopped the Second Amendment from holding back state and local government, that was struck down. So it goes into C tier for now. That could become tremendously more important if we see governments try to start to leverage that. The next one comes from 1939, United States versus Miller. This one dealt with the National Firearms Act, and specifically, we are talking about short-barreled shotguns. So Miller was basically a gangster at the end of the day who was actually dead and had no one representing his side of the arguments when it made it to the United States Supreme Court challenging the 1934 National Firearms Act. The so-called National Firearms Act, or NFA for short, deals with basically the registration and needing to require permission slips and paying a special tax if you wanted to possess a machine gun, if you wanted to possess a short barrel shotgun, short barrel rifle, 
any other weapon, think James Bond Q sort of stuff, suppressors and other doodads as well. So the issue here that made Miller really interesting for a lot of people was the fact that the U.S. Supreme Court basically said, look, short barrel shotgun is not protected by the Second Amendment because basically it doesn't have a nexus. It doesn't have enough of a connection between that and serving in an organized militia because a short barrel shotgun basically isn't a weapon of war. Following that logic, that would seem to suggest that basically anything the military has is now protected by the Second Amendment and I'm allowed to have. However, this has been basically touched on, let's say, by subsequent courts in both Heller, McDonald, and in Brune. We'll get to a little bit of that later. If you want to see more of an in-depth exploration of this topic, as well as subjects involving dangerous, unusual weapons, you know what to do. Let me know in the comment field below. The importance of the Miller case was that up until DC versus Heller in 2008, it was really only the big 20th century Second Amendment case. There were other smaller ones we'll get to in a moment, but really it was the biggest time that the Second Amendment itself started to be looked at by the U.S. Supreme Court as far as an analysis and a dissection goes. But again, a lot of this has been, for better or worse, superseded and kind of watered down and incorporated and drawn through, as we'll touch on briefly, by subsequent courts. As a result, it's going to be going in the C tier. It's not overruled law. Basically, the U.S. Supreme Court did wind up speaking about it and trying to tease things out into, in my view, trying to reinterpret it and whitewash it a little bit. But it's still there. It's still explicitly found to be good law by the court. Court. I have a feeling that future courts are going to be talking about what constitutes good versus bad law when we're dealing with a lot of these so-called assault weapons bans. So for the time being, it's going to be going in the C tier. The next one's a bit of a deep cut coming from 1980. It's Lewis versus U.S. This was a case dealing with whether or not Congress could rationally conclude that any felony conviction, even an allegedly invalid conviction, is a sufficient basis on which to prohibit a possession of firearm. The short version of this is we've got a man, Mr. Lewis, who was convicted of being a felon possession of firearm. He argued that under the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark ruling in an unrelated issue called Gideon versus Rainwright, that's the idea that everybody's entitled to representation and if you cannot have one a public defender or the court will appoint one for you well, mr lewis was not represented when he was convicted of a crime prior to gideon versus wainwright then gideon versus wainwright happened and theoretically mr lewis could have filed or potentially gotten rid of his felony conviction but he did not do that instead he got himself arrested subsequent to a felon in possession of firearm charge. And he argued as his defense, look, I shouldn't have this new charge because I could collaterally attack the old charge and make it go away. The US Supreme Court said, no, you had an opportunity to do that. There's other options as well, such as governor's pardons. And I'm not necessarily voicing my support for this. Let me be clear. Don't shoot the messenger. But the U.S. Supreme Court said no. Now, as a note, the U.S. Supreme Court has already heard oral arguments on November 7th in a new case called Rahimi, which is going to be dealing with issues of prohibited possessors and who are the people in the phrase, the rights of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So I suspect that Lewis is going to become bad law or it's at least going to be completely overshadowed by the Rahimi case when we get a written decision on that coming out next year in 2024. And due to its very narrow scope, combined with the fact that I think it's going to get trumped very quickly, I'm going to put this, I'm thinking about C tier, but ultimately I'm going to put this in a low C, high D, or I'm ultimately going to put this in a D tier for right now. So now we go to 1992. We're talking United States versus Thompson Center Arms Company. What the heck happened here? We know all those questions about, hey, constructive possession, constructive intent. Well, look, the U.S. Supreme Court's already covered this, and by the way, so has this channel, but let's talk about that quickly right now. So Thompson Center is a company that was selling basically this kit, and it came with a 21-inch barrel as well as a 10-inch barrel, and it could allow you to configure either a pistol, a rifle, or an SBR, depending upon how you assembled it, a little bit like a Mr. Potato Head doll. And the ATF said, look, because this could be an SBR, a short-barreled rifle, therefore subject to felonies unless you complied with registration and paying your tax under the National Firearms Act, that if you failed to do so, prison for you, okay? Because it could be constructed in an SBR, therefore it, it is an SBR because of constructive intent, constructive possession. Because it could be assembled into it, it must be it. Possession of all those parts together is sign of constructive possession and constructive intent, so-called, showing that hey, this is the direction I want to take it in. Thompson Center very cleverly 
filed and paid for a tax stamp on this, then demanded a refund. That gave them standing. They sued when they were denied the refund and off they went. The United States Supreme Court, in a nutshell, again, longer breakdown of this in other videos, said no. This could be constructed into a lawful handgun or a lawful rifle. It doesn't have to be assembled only into an illegal short barreled rifle. And therefore, due to potential ambiguities, not to mention the rule of lenity, L-E-N-I-T-Y, which deals with the concept of if we've got a little bit of an ambiguous statute, reasonably ambiguous criminal statute, interpretation goes to the defendant. As a result, no. Good to go. One of the lessons that you down the lens need to keep in mind is that if you do have parts, for instance, short barrels, you need to make sure that your firearms have been assembled into a lawful configuration or at a very minimum, if you want to dance in the gray, even though the US Supreme Court says it's not gray, your local sheriff may disagree, then look, you need to make sure there's a lawful configuration you could put things in as well. So that deals with that so-called law of constructive intent, constructive possession. And for that, because it's still relevant to this day, I'm going to put that into the A tier. U.S. versus Thompson Center goes A tier because this is still something that absolutely gets noticed. It's still something that bears and looms over criminal law, even though a lot of people and a lot of courts don't know about it. But keep in mind that is out there. So next one, we now move to 2008 District of Columbia versus Heller. I'm going to tell you right up front, S tier. This basically clinched and concretized the individual right to own guns. It is not a corporate community right reserved only to, for instance, the National Guard. You down the lens have an individual right to possess a firearm. If this case had gone the other way back in 2008, we would be in a very different place right now. And I suspect we would be well on the way to complete citizen disarmament in many different states. But thanks to that ruling, the Second Amendment is on very different footing, much safer footing, and it's almost impossible to understate the importance of D.C. versus Heller. But the Supreme Court wasn't done, and in 2010, it had McDonald versus City of Chicago. But unfortunately, the Heller decision did leave a loophole, because you see, the District of Columbia, it's not a state. So we still had the Second Amendment issue tied off to the Cruikshank Court back from 1876 of, hey, look, okay, the Second Amendment, yeah, it's an individual right, but it's an individual right that only deals and applies and checks the federal government's power. Then in 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court in McDonald versus City of Chicago said, no, we're undoing Cruikshank, we're undoing Presser versus Illinois to an extent that it dealt with this issue, and we absolutely affirm that the 14th Amendment incorporates the Second Amendment against state and local government. So there you have it. Without Heller, without McDonald, this would not be stopping states and local governments from infringing on the Second Amendment, which isn't to say that they aren't doing it every single day and they aren't going to continue to do it, but at least we have the weapons to fight them and we have hope in the court. I kind of view Heller and McDonald largely coming out of the same lineage of cases, but just the same. McDonald easy S tier case, almost as S tier as Heller, because without the individual right, then hey, we are all sunk on this. So McDonald is almost as important, but at the same time, it's definitely an easy S tier case. Thanks for sticking around this long in the video. Don't forget to stay to the end to see our noted quote of the day series. Show your support for the Second Amendment. Hit that like button. It tells the algorithm this is good stuff, and it tells me you want to see more content like this. It's the simplest and easiest way to show your support for this channel as well. If you found us just by kind of browsing through, thanks for staying with us. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you don't want to miss any future content. The next time the U.S. Supreme Court got involved was 2016 in Catano versus Massachusetts. This dealt with Massachusetts basically banning certain electronic devices that numbered a little over 200,000 at the time. And the United States Supreme Court ruled that the Second Amendment extends prima facie, in other words, at first blush on its face, this is where the needle starts, to all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the founding. That's obviously huge. The Catano case also rings huge when it comes to the discussions of what constitutes a common use weapon, because the U.S. Supreme Court talked about an extended language surrounding, hey, if something's in common use, then that means it's absolutely protected. And that was not the last time the U.S. Supreme Court would be looking at that language as well, surrounding words like common use. We'll get to that shortly. But the Catano case is something that if you watch our videos, you know that we talk about quite a bit because we're talking about common use when we're talking about AR-15s, when we're talking about so-called high-capacity magazines. All these sorts of issues 
ultimately come back heavily, not exclusively, but heavily back to the Catano decision. So Catano, both because of what it meant at the time and also how it looms large over existing fights over the Second Amendment, as well as future fights over the Second Amendment, S tier as well. And that brings us up finally to 2022. New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus Bruin, B-R-U-E-N. This was huge. Easy S tier. I'm going to put it just below Heller because without Heller, nothing else is possible. But I'm going to slide it below Heller, but above everything else, the Bruin Court decision. Why was this so important? Well, it came up in the context of challenging New York State's so-called Sullivan Law, which basically made New York a may issue state. In other words, they didn't have to issue you a license, even if you met the objective criteria, because there was some subjective criteria as well. And basically they said, no, if you meet certain qualifications, so for instance, if you're an adult citizen, you're trying to carry an ordinary weapon, which they specifically included as semi-automatic handguns, and you're talking about non-sensitive locations, which they talked about basically polling locations when there's a vote, as well as certain core government locations, like areas where legislative bodies are in session, courts are in session, and other core duties of government. Those can be sensitive locations in areas that may be closely analogous to them, and you also have to be a non-prohibited possessor. Adult citizens, ordinary weapons, specifically protecting semi-automatic handguns, non-sensitive locations, and non-prohibited possessors. Then look, you absolutely have the right to carry arms. You absolutely have an individual right to possess weapons. And you can carry those arms outside the home. May issue done. We're now in a shall issue regime, which must be based on objective criteria, not subjective criteria like, hey, is this person a good moral character? And that's going to be based on what we think about their Facebook or social media history or something like this. Objective character. But here's the big kicker. And for those of you who have been legal nerds with me on the Second Amendment issues, you know where I'm going with this. They completely changed in the Bruin Court decision the legal test about how a court is to decide. It doesn't matter if we're talking about your local county trial court, state courts, or we're talking about federal courts, federal courts of appeal, you name it. How are courts to decide whether or not a firearm law infringes on the Second Amendment? You see, there's all these different layers of scrutiny, like rational basis, intermediate scrutiny, strict scrutiny, and so forth, to determine whether or not laws pass constitutional muster. And the U.S. Supreme Court said we're done with that when it comes to the Second Amendment. Now, if someone's activity that a regulation or a law is seeking to regulate or to infringe on potentially is protected by the Second Amendment, then the government bears the burden of proof to show that that regulation or law fits within the nation's historical tradition of regulating firearms. That's big. The Supreme Court also went on to point out that not all history is created equal and basically strongly hinted at the fact of, look, we're kind of talking about the 19th century, perhaps the early republics. So we're talking about up to 1830s. And where the pro versus anti-Second Amendment arguments have come down is, are we allowed to extend into the 1880s, for instance, where we have the 14th Amendment issue coming into effect. Some courts are even trying to push more liberally well beyond that into the 20th century. And some legislatures have tried to claim that, hey, laws that were passed in the 1990s are even part of our nation's historical firearms tradition, something that the U.S. Supreme Court, I don't think will agree with them on. So there's going to be issues as to where we try to draw that line. If you're pro-Second Amendment, early republic, colonial period, if you're anti-Second Amendment, as recently as possible is basically what this is. And that, of course, also leaves questions surrounding the constitutionality of the 1934 National Firearms Act, because the U.S. Supreme Court and Heller basically talked about the fact there may still be classifications of firearms that are going to be allowed to be banned. If you want to see a whole video on that, let me know in the comment section below. But for right now, I'm trying to keep this as a tier list. And we're talking about Bruin. Bruin, easy S tier, right below Heller. So guys, there's the nine times that the United States Supreme Court has thus far ruled on the Second Amendment. Let me know what you think about all this. Did I get the order wrong? How would you order them? And we've got three big U.S. Supreme Court cases involving Second Amendment coming up. We're talking about Rahimi. We're talking about Cargill v. Garland. We're talking about 
INRA versus VULO, those three courts. If you want to see a video on that, let me know in the comment field below. Show your support for the Second Amendment by hitting that like button. I look forward to joining the comment field discussion, which I suspect may be lively. Let's close with our quote on the day. Our quote of the day comes from a noted Roman speaker, Seneca, who said, we suffer more in imagination than in reality. Hopefully you got something out of that. I look forward to seeing the next one. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content, and we'll see you in the next one.